right, church, we're going to sing a new song, and that speaks of the good things that God does in our lives. As it becomes familiar, sing it out with us. Amen. Hey, well, today is an exciting morning because we are celebrating baptism this morning. Go ahead and give your attention to the baptistry. Good morning, church. So this morning we have Easton Hofstetter here, and he's accepted Jesus to be his Lord and Savior, and we're just so excited for him. It's been great watching him grow and the man of the Lord that he is today, and we just pray for him. All right, you ready? Repeat after me. I believe. Christ that Jesus Christ is the Son of the Living God. Is the Son of the Living God. I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ died. Died. Was buried. Was buried. And rose again on the third day. And rose again on the third day. I accept Jesus. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. Awesome. With that, church, I baptize Easton in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. family. 
This is Molly Berkey, and uh, she has been a joy for me to get to know her over the last year and a half. A fun fact, I met her actually in my ROTC unit at Middle Brook High School. So what a pleasure it was and a thrill and just excitement for her to ask me to baptize her today and watch her grow in her faith and make this declaration. All right, Molly, you ready? You ready to repeat after me? I believe, I believe that Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Is the Son of the living God. I believe. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, RCC. You may be seated. What a wonderful way in which to start the service uh, today. If you have not received the communion elements when you walked in the doors, uh, if you could just raise your hands and please keep your hand up and one of the ushers will bring those to you. Thank you so much. If you're anything like me, I know many Christians, with myself included and at the top of the list, who enjoy talking about God's love. God's love for me, God's love for you, and God's love for this entire world. And while talking about the love of God as Jesus followers is extremely important, being a Jesus follower who actually embraces that love and who daily and desperately practices the discipline of running straight into the arms of Jesus is much different than just knowing about God's love and much different than even talking about that love. In his sermon today, Pastor Nathan is going to be talking about the concept of repentance. And many times, the church worldwide has reduced repentance to turning away from our sins. And while this is extremely true, repentance also involves running straight into the arms of Jesus, receiving and embracing his love and his forgiveness. As we are about to participate in communion as a family of God, we aren't just affirming that we have knowledge that Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. We aren't just affirming that we have this intellectual understanding that Jesus rose from the dead. We are also declaring and we are proclaiming that we are committed to receiving and embracing the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. In his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, James Cone says the following, the gospel of Jesus is not a rational concept to be explained in a theory of salvation, but a story about God's presence and Jesus' solidarity with the oppressed, which led to his death on a cross. What is redemptive is the faith that God snatches victory out of defeat, life out of death, and hope out of despair. Today, as we eat the bread and drink the cup as family, may we be people who don't just know facts about God's love, but may we be people who receive and embrace that love and who desperately and audaciously run straight into the arms of Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be your children, to be your servants. There is nothing and there is no one that compares to the love that you have for us and the forgiveness that you constantly shower upon us. So Father, while your love is a fact and a beautiful reality, help us to receive and embrace that love. Father, in this time where we get to eat the bread and drink the cup as family, help us to know that your love is not just some theoretical concept to be mastered, but it is a tangible reality to live in and rest in. And we ask all these things through the power of Jesus' name, amen.
again. Give him praise. Awesome being together. Welcome this morning. Have a seat, please. My name is Nathan. I want to welcome you. We have a gift for you. If you're a first-time guest, please come by and see us at the Welcome Center. We'd love to say hi to you and get to know you. And we're a big family here that lifts up Jesus, and that's just what we're known for. And I want to encourage you with this. We are so thankful for all those who are joining us online. Can we give a round of applause of all our brothers and sisters who are joining us online today? We love you guys. So glad to have you join us today. And I want you to know we'd love to hear from you. Please fill out that card that's there in front of you. And while you're filling it out, you can actually put prayer requests on that card. And we want you to know we're a praying church. We're here because of the power of prayer. We believe in it so much that we started a weekly prayer event. That's open to you, your friends. A great idea is to, to come to this, then go to eat with somebody afterward, invite them to come. But we're going to be here every Wednesday at 11 a.m. In this, in this room, and we would love to pray over your prayer requests. Um, we, we'll do that as well. So hand them in to the prayer team who will be up here, or you can put them in the giving box when we're out the door. And we'll let you know this about this church, RCC, is that we're an incredibly generous church. God moves in powerful ways throughout your generosity. The people you just saw baptized, people, we had another person baptized earlier today, all because of your generosity. Your generosity is changing eternity for more people than you can imagine. We're thinking that this year, RCC may baptize over 200 people. 200 people may be baptized this year. And that's not possible without your generosity. I just want you to know that. So it's fueling, it's fueling people flooding into heaven. And I want to encourage you with this. Because of generosity, we can, we can help all kinds of ministries like our women's ministry. Right now, you give it up for our women's ministry teams. They talk to us about the women's ministry. Good morning, everyone. My name is Julie Davis, and this is Elissa Dorman, and we are just a very small portion of the women's ministry. So we are here to invite you to some upcoming events that we have. So take notes, go to our website, go to our RCC Women's page, uh, Facebook page, and you'll find all of the information. But our first event is going to be the first Christmas party of the season you go to because it is November 28th. Um, we really want you to join us. It's a Tuesday night from 6 to 8. The theme is Favorite Things. We're going to be celebrating our very favorite thing, which is Jesus Christ coming down to earth to show us what real love looks like. So we'll be celebrating that. Also, we're asking you to bring your favorite dish that you like to serve at Christmas time and then send me the email. We're going to make a small little cookbook, and that will be your gift for coming to the Women's Ministry Christmas Party. You'll go away with some of the recipes that we have here at the church but all the information is on the website and then on December 2nd it's a Saturday morning we are going to be serving breakfast to the Toys for Tots families that come in to receive their presents that you so generously donate so if you or your family are looking for a service um, event to do together Saturday December 2nd sign up on our Facebook page for that we'd love your help all right, and the next event that we have for our RCC women is the Women's Retreat. Um, it's going to be January 19th through 21st. Um, pack your bags, ladies, because we are headed to St. Simon's Island at Epworth by the Sea. And if you've never been, it is beautiful. So I highly recommend that you join us. Um, we're going to have a speaker and author coming up from South Florida to speak to us. Um, and she's going to be focusing on how to put our faith into action. And I know from personal experience last year, um, I walked away with mentors, with friends, and it was just an amazing weekend where I met so many women that I don't normally get to see because there are so many services and it's such a big church. So I highly recommend that you guys come and I hope to see you there. All right, give it up for Julie and Lisa. Thank you so much. And uh, we want to encourage you once again to look that up and be, be plugged in. Also, because of your generosity, we are being a blessing to those in need this Thanksgiving. We got Thanksgiving blessing bags, and we have tons of items still yet to be claimed. So you can go out there and get one of those items, claim it, and say you'll bring it into the church, and then we'll build a big basket for each and every family. We're trying to be a blessing to over 130 uh, families here in our community, and you can be a big part of that by grabbing one of those cards, or even two of those cards, they'll be out there in the atrium on the left, uh, right there. You'll see a couple people at the outreach area, and I tell you right now, that's going to make a huge, huge difference if you grab one of those. Um, we're going to continue our series called Pivot, and I want to, I want to thank uh, Ty. Didn't Ty do a great job kicking off the series last week? So Pastor Ty did a phenomenal job 
And if you missed that, make sure you go back and listen to that because that helps today make a little bit more sense. Uh, last week I was gone because um, I like pain, I like agony. That means I'm an Auburn fan. I went to go see Auburn lose again. And um, a country called Alabama, I don't know if you've ever heard of Alabama, but it's a country far away. And there I got to see some relatives. That's where, you know, my roots come from. That's why we were, you know, barefoot wherever we go no, no, normally. And so my, my brother, I spent a lot of time with my brother, great guy, wonderful guy. He's got lots of abilities, but one ability he doesn't have is direction. And I got to say a little bit of that, but it reminded me of a story about my brother. He's in Montgomery, Alabama one time. You can see a map of Alabama up on the screen. And Montgomery is where I was born, where he was born. And basically, it is uh, right there almost in the heart of Alabama. And he lives at the time in Atlanta. And so uh, he's supposed to be driving, well, it doesn't show up, but anyway, he's supposed to be driving north to Atlanta. And he's on his way, uh, heading uh, north, he thought. And two hours in the drive, all of a sudden, he sees signs for Mobile. Mobile is due south several hours of Montgomery, and he realized he was going the wrong direction. This was before GPS. If he had GPS, they would have said, well, recalibrating, right? How many times did your GPS tell you to recalibrate? It would have told him to recalibrate, but he didn't have that to recalibrate him towards Atlanta. He ended up in Mobile. And so, and so I think today this series is kind of a recalibration, this pivot series of our soul, because many of us, we can lose track from time to time with our life. How many of you ever seen the movie called Titanic? Raise your hand if you remember the movie Titanic. All right, many of us old people raising our hand. So in that movie, I don't know if you remember the scene in that movie where kind of the underprivileged were at the lower levels and they were locked behind bars. And they couldn't get out when the ship was sinking and the, and the rich people and the more privileged people were escaping. I want you to imagine if you're behind one of those locked bars in that ship. Just, just picture yourself right now behind a light bar. It's cold. It's dark. Water is coming up from your ankles to your knees all the way to your waist. And then it starts getting to your chest. And your friend with you just says, you know what? I got to do something. And they dive down. And, and you don't know where they went. And they're gone for a long time. And then 12 minutes goes by, and all of a sudden, they pop back to the surface, and they go, I found a way to get out. Hold on to my hand, and I'll lead you out of here. And you realize that's your only chance to escape this kind of grave of water. And so you just kind of, now the water's at your neck level, and you hold your breath, and you dive down holding on for dear life. And you don't know how long you can hold your breath. You don't know if you can even fit through the narrow opening. But you keep holding your friend's hand and you keep thinking, if I ever get out of this, I'm never going on another cruise the rest of my life. That's what you're thinking. And right when you think you cannot hold your breath any longer, all of a sudden you break up out of the surface of the water and you see a lifeboat. And that is your way to life. And you hug and you high five your friend, thank you for saving your life. I'm, I'm going to be grateful for you the rest of my days and then you stop and you think for a moment and you go, you know, that was the most exhilarating experience of my life. I've never had a rush like that in all, as long as I lived. In fact, I think I'll go back and do that one more time. And that would be crazy. The ship is sinking. Why would you ever go back? And your friend says, if you appreciate what I did for you, if you, if you love me, don't do that. Make this a point, a pivot in your life to head in the direction of life instead of death. And out of honor to your friend who risked their life for your life, wouldn't you avoid that tunnel of dark water, cold, dark water? Wouldn't you do that? Of course you would. Last week, we talked about pivoting our souls, and it starts with belief. That is a trust in Jesus as a substitutory death for my sin. He died in my place. He is the Son of God. He rose on the third day. So belief in that. And then belief is also taking Jesus' hand, diving in and trusting that Jesus is the only way that leads to life. He's the only way, if you really want to truly pivot your soul, that all starts at that point of following, trusting, believing Jesus. But then the next point of salvation is very critical that we don't talk about enough. And that is the turning point of my life, pivoting my life, and the Bible is called repentance. Everybody say the word repentance on the count of three. One, two, three. Repentance. Repentance means a change of direction. Repentance means I have come to a turning point in my life. 
Just like diving back into the flooding waters of Titanic would be nuts, right? It'd be totally insane. The pivot point says, now that I put my belief in Jesus Christ to save me from my moral foul-ups and my sins, it would be crazy for me to dive back into the life that Jesus has saved me from. In fact, here's what Scripture says about this word. In Acts chapter 3, it says, repent then and say what? Do what, church? We do what? Turn to God. We turn, pivot to God, we repent, so that your sins may be wiped out. And as believers of, of, of Jesus, when they heard Peter speak in Acts chapter 2, they were convicted of the heart, so we know they believed, they knew they, they took that first step. But then it says, they asked the question, what shall we do to be saved, to be rescued? And here's the very first word out of Peter's mouth. Look what, what he says. The first word is what? Repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Repentance means now I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm pivoting my life in a new direction. And after all, if I did not need to make changes in my life, I would not need Jesus. It reminds me of the woman who went to go sign up for exercise classes. And the instructor looked at her and said, be sure next week to wear loose clothing. And she looked at him and she says, well, if I had any loose clothing... I wouldn't need this stupid class, you know. And that's the reality. I mean, if I wasn't a sinner deserving death and eternal separation from God, I wouldn't need Jesus. But I am. So I need to repent. I need to pivot in a new direction. Now, this turning point is not a one-time event. It's something that we do every day of our life, whether we gave our life to Jesus just like these young people did just a few minutes ago or I did it 10 years ago or 50 years ago. My, my lifestyle now it's to repent every single day. So how do we do that? Like, what are the markers of truly pivoting my life in the direction of Jesus? Well, there's four of them I'm going to talk about with you today. Number one is this, and that is a conviction about sin. Repentance means that, that I have a conviction. Hey, I've made some moral foul-ups in my life. The Bible says this, that if we claim to be without sin, we what? We deceive. We're not just other people, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, this self-deception goes so deep. Like, you hear people say all the time, I'm a good person. Like, they compare themselves, they, they compare themselves to the worst person they know, like Hitler. Like, I haven't killed anybody today. Like, that's what they're doing. But let's just see how, like, good we really are, okay? And, and the way I do that is kind of do a moral inventory. Let's just take, like, the, let's just take the basics. The basics, not get too far into this. Let's just take the Ten Commandments, and here's what I want you to do. I do this about every so often here at RCC. I want you to keep track of the Ten Commandments you have not broken. Can you do that? Keep track of the Ten Commandments that you have not broken. Number one is this, you shall have no other gods before me. So if you've always kept Jesus or God, number one, in your life, uh, nothing's ever come between you and God, not like hobbies or money or sex or people. God has always been number one, and you're, then you can count that as one you've never broken, okay? Keep track with how many you've never broken. Number two, you shall not make for yourself an idol. So if you've never carved a graven image and set it up in your backyard, you can count that as one you've never broken. Aren't you glad that's in there, all right? So we all should have one right now, I hope. Number three. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God in vain. So if you've never misused in a flippant or vain way the name of God or the name of Jesus Christ, you've never texted OMG, <laughs> you can count that as one that you've never broken. Number four, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. So anytime it was time to worship, you were always there. You never skipped church because you want to sleep in or you want to catch some ball game. And when you were at church, you kept it holy by totally staying focused on everything that the pastor was saying. And then you can count that as one that you've never broken. Number five, honor your father and your mother. So if you've always obeyed your parents when you were a child, you never made fun of them behind their backs about what their clothes they were wearing, you know. As they've gotten older... You've always been respectful, always spoke kindly about your parents, never complained about them. You can count that as one that you've never broken. Number six, you shall not, you shall not murder. So in the New Testament, Jesus says that if you have anger in your heart towards a brother, you actually commit sin of murder in your heart. But we won't count it that way, okay? I want to help you out here. If you've never actually killed somebody, you can count that as one you've never broken. Number seven, 
you shall not commit adultery. So if you've never been sexually involved before marriage, after marriage, you've always maintained marriage exclusivity. Jesus says that if you've lusted after someone in your heart, you commit adultery in your heart. But we won't count it that way. Help you out a little bit. If you've never committed adultery, you can count that as one that you've never actually broken. Number eight, you shall not steal. So if you've never taken something that didn't belong to you, you know, never took a dollar out of your mom's purse when she wasn't looking, never took an answer off somebody else's test, if you've... If you have no holiday end towels in your house, okay, you can count that as one. Apparently you do. All right, anyway, count that as one you never broke. And number nine, you shall not give false testimony. So if you've never lied, never said something that wasn't true, never told your mom, I'm going over here, when actually you were going over there. Um, and when someone asks you, how do I look? You go, man, you look great today, even though you look terrible. Um, if you've never said something that wasn't true, you can count that as one that you've never broken. Number 10, last but not least, you shall not covet. So if you've never wished you could have something that belonged to someone else, like somebody else's car, somebody else's home, somebody else's job, somebody else's family, then you can count that as one that you've never broken. All right. Out of the top 10, you have your number. So let me find out. How many of you have kept all 10 commandments? Raise your hand if you've kept all 10, never broke all 10 I want to see who they are. We want to worship you right now. All right. We want to worship you. We got one person we're going to worship over there. All right. Um, obviously, he broke it. This, the lying is in there somewhere. Anyway, how about nine? Anybody got nine? It's an A. Anybody got an A? Low A. How about eight? Seven? Six? This is a wicked church. This is. <laughs> Y'all are worse than the other services. Anyway, I'm kidding. I'm not going to go any lower. Some of you are wondering how low is he going to go. I'm going to stop right there, getting nervous. But I figured the way that I went through that, I've kept three of them. One, I've never made a graven image, and the other two are none of your business. I'm not going to tell you. So 1 John, let me remind you once again what 1 John says. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we, what? we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Jesus says, and when the Holy Spirit comes, he will do what, church? He will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. You know why sometimes you're in church, you feel uneasy? It's because God's convicting you of that sin. There's something there that you're trying to suppress, something you're trying to hide. You don't want anybody knowing about it. And God's, you know, God's convicting you. And that's why when Isaiah stood before a perfect God, he says, woe is me, a man of unclean lips. Like we realize how unclean we are. We stand before a perfect God. That's how some of us feel. God, you say, I haven't been, I haven't been the parent my kids deserve. God, I, I haven't told my spouse the whole truth. God, I'm carrying hatred and resentment towards someone. God, I don't, I don't honor you with how I treat my body. God, if I'm honest, I'm just so sexually goofed up right now. God, I, I, I'm cheated in school. I've cheated in business. I'm greedy. I'm self-centered. And family, that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicting us of sin it's one of the marks of a genuine pivot point in our lives. That's the first step. Number two is this, and that is we're genuinely going to pivot and repent. That is we have to have a brokenness over sin, a brokenness over sin. Scripture says this in, in, in Psalms. It says the sacrifice you desire, God, is a what? Broken spirit. It's a broken spirit. You, you will not reject a broken and what? A repentant heart, oh God. This is the attitude that God is saying, God, I, I'm broken by this. I'm broken by what I've done, and I'm genuinely sorry. Now, we know it's like to be on the other side of this, like when a cop pulls us over, we go, sorry, officer. We're not sorry. We're just sorry we got caught, right? I mean, let's just be honest. But I think about a time that happened in my life, the first time I really felt like I got broken. I was 12 years old. My dad was starting up a father-son camp out. That's one reason why men's ministry is such a passion of mine. Because I know it's like to be a little guy and hanging around older men and just be mentored by them and just do life with them. And that's kind of the, the culture my dad was setting up with his father-son camp out at our church. And I was playing a lot of football at the time. I grew up in a very football heavy. I didn't really realize there was any other sports out there. That's how heavy it was. Um, it was just football, football, football. And so I, I thought I was the next Bo Jackson, you know. And so we're going to play football. And it's, it's a pivotal time when you're going to play football. You have to decide at this age, are we going to play touch or are we going to play tackle? 
and obviously the choice is tackle. I mean, the football is not touched. It has to be tackled. You know, that's kind of how, how it was. And this little kid, this other kid was like in my face about it. He's like, no, we're going to play touch. I'm like, no, we're going to play tackle. And all of a sudden, because the parents and adults were sensible, we chose touch. And this kid looked at me and said something in effect, ha, I told you we're going to play touch. I don't know exactly what he said, but I know exactly what I said. And I looked right at him, saw red. In that moment, I said, I'm going to kick your butt. But I didn't say butt. And I said it loud, and I didn't care who heard it. Because it was just in the moment. And all of a sudden, his dad, his dad was there. I didn't care. I mean, that's just kind of how it was. And all of a sudden, I looked over, and I saw my student pastor. And I saw my dad's best friend, like, within 20 feet over to my right. And their jaws, at the same time, just dropped. And it was in that moment, it was kind of a wake-up call. And I just walked off the field, and they were asking, you can come back. I'm like, no, I just can't. I mean, it just hit me how wrong that was. And that's just how I talked. Like, when the adults weren't around, that was just normal. And, and all of a sudden, I, 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 was, I was upset. One, because my dad's going to kill me when he finds out. <laughs> but, but the other reason is I disappointed my student pastor I looked up to immensely, who baptized me, I, I remember, years later. Uh, I looked up to my dad's best friend, who was like a, another dad to me, and I realized I disappointed him. It was ra- before he died, he'd watch us every week online, probably trying to figure out, how did that kid become a pastor? How did that happen? But then I really was heartbroken because I realized I disappointed my dad, and it broke me. And because of that, that moment, of realizing what I had done, like waking up, that, I, that's just always what I was doing, but all of a sudden I realized how bad it was, I, I changed my language, it really authentically changed my language, at a young age I, I stopped doing that, because I realized how stupid it was, and how God's not calling me to do that with, with my tongue, and I, I'm just so thankful for that moment, it reminds me when Peter realized that he denied Jesus three times, it says the rooster crowed, and when it, it dawned on him what he did, like it did, on, like it did for me, it broke him. And the scripture says that he wept bitterly. And my question to you is, have you ever had that brokenness over your sin? Another question would be, have you ever heard the rooster crow in your life? I've had it crow in my life several times. And when you wake up, it breaks you and it changes you. So we get get convicted, we get broken, and that leads to the next point when we pivot, and that is... We have a, basically a confession. We confess our sin. There's two components to this, a confession to God, and there's a confession to people. Let me talk about the God confession. The God confession doesn't mean we kind of mouth the words and go, oh, God, you know what I did, whatever. No, 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 it's saying this. It's saying, God, I agree with you about this sin. Because here's the reality. We justify sin. I know I've done it many times in my life. But when I, when I pivot I'm saying, God, I agree with what your word says about this sin. I have changed my mind about this sin. I know, God, it hurts you. And I know it hurts others. And I know it hurts me. And it caused Jesus to die on the cross. And it needs to stop. And if you're at this pivot point in your life, the Bible says, if we confess our sins to him, guess what? God is faithful and just to do what, church? To forgive us, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So while God is the only one who can save us when we confess, we also confess to another person because you find encouragement to overcome that sin. James says this, confess your sins to who? Each other. And pray for each other so that you'll be healed. And this is why it's so important you've got at least one person in your life that you can tell anything to and tell everything to. One thing I've noticed in my life group is that when people open up and they just kind of say, you know what, I just haven't been on it today. I've been rude to my family, been rude to my spouse, rude to my kids, I kicked the dog, I've been, a, you know, just a pain to my coworkers. You know what happens in my group? I can tell you what doesn't happen. What doesn't happen is people go, you're a one sick puppy. I mean, I get out of our group. You know what happens in our group? Me too. Me too. Welcome to the club. I struggle with the same thing today. And when you confess something, what you realize is this, you're not the only one. No matter what that sin is, you're not the only one. Have you ever experienced that? 
It's so good to hear someone who's experienced the grace of Jesus reassure us and tell us in that moment we confess our sin. Hey, God has forgiven you for that. And I want you to know something. He loves you and I love you too. It's crazy when you tell somebody something so dark and you find out how much they love you. They love you just as much after they found out whatever that thing is as much as they did before. It reminds you how much God loves you too. Family, there's so much freedom when you confess your sins to God into one another. I'd put it this way. God forgives us, but we confess our sins, our friends reassure us. God forgives us, our friends reassure us. Now, you can be convicted by your sin. You can be broken by your sin. You confess your sin. But the next one is massive, and that is we need to be transformation. We need a transformation from our sin. Now, think about the difference between Peter and Judas. Both of them, you got, you got, you got Judas who betrayed Jesus and Peter who denied Jesus. Both of them were convicted by their sin. Both of them, you know, had a brokenness by their sin. Both of, the, both of them confessed their sin, but only Peter pivoted and repented by being transformed from his sin. Listen, do you know what will happen in your relationship with God if you just get convicted and broken and confess, but you stop there? It's the same thing that happens when you and people, when there's unresolved conflict. If you have a relationship with God, it's going to be like this, just like it is with people, and that is you're just going to be cordial with God, and you'll be distant from God. You'll be cordial because you'll come to church, you'll sing songs and have good feelings every now and then about God. But you'll be distant because when you get really close to real change, it gets too convicting. And so you keep your distance. And I'm just warning you as a friend, if God brings you to the point of transformation to make some real change in your life, don't say no now. Saying no to God is what got you in the deep water in the first place. Saying no to God is what messed up your marriage. Saying no to God is what created all those problems, all those mis misunderstandings with your kids. Saying no to God is what got you in debt. Look what John the Baptist says, prove by the way that you live that you have repented. Prove that you've repented from your sins and turned to God. I know some of you are pushing back right now. You're like, well... That can never happen. A leopard can't change its spots. A nasty people get, person gets nastier. A cranky person gets crankier. A greedy person gets greedier. There's no way people can change. You know, I've been doing ministry for full time, my 24th year now. 27, 28 years in ministry now. I started when I was five. That's a lie. It's one of the Ten Commandments again. Anyway, and through it all, I'm amazed at watching how God has transformed people. I mean, really has changed them. Really changed them. They've been transformed by God. I've seen God transform hateful, bitter people right before my eyes into outrageously loving, non-prejudiced people who live with radical inclusivity. I've seen self-centered people in a selfie life, in a selfie world, all of a sudden get selfless and start watching out for the marginalized in our world in our community. And listen, if you doubt all this, that someone can change, let me share with you a story about my friend Josh. He and his family are up on the screen, Karen, and their kids. And Josh came to our church a couple of years ago, right after an amazing experience with God. And what happened before he came here was he lived a life, basically he, at, at most good part of his adult life, he would work late at night, get off early in the morning, and then go drink himself silly. Just, just drink and get hammered and then fall asleep and have a hangover and then go to work and do it again the next day and do it again the next day. And this went on day after day, week after week, month after month, year. It almost lasted for two decades. And it's amazing when he lived that lifestyle and he knew God was kind of prompting him to change, but it wasn't until he hit rock bottom that he finally gave up the bottle and he picked up the Bible. In fact, Josh is in the room right now. He just told me that he just read the whole Bible, just finished it first time. It took him a year and a half. 
Isn't that pretty cool? And I'm telling you, this guy is now on fire for Jesus. He's leading his family in the ways of Jesus. In fact, his daughter is stationed in Las Vegas. My wife and uh, Anthony, Pastor Anthony, his wife, just hung out with her in Las Vegas. And, the, and it's awesome watching God just surround his arms around this family. And now Josh is on fire for Jesus Christ. He's now even helped me lead my life group. Can we just give God the praise and how God's transformed his life? I mean, you'll never convince me that God can't change lives. Why? Because I see stories like this each and every week here at RCC. Because the truth is God is still in the business of pivoting lives. He still is doing this. In fact, I'll say this, he can change yours. I don't care what you've done, what was done to you, how long you've been doing it, he can change yours. You know, the church got launched in Jerusalem and since that time, over 2,000 years, when people believe, put their faith in Jesus, their belief in Jesus, they have repented from their sins, and then they have marked that repentance with a baptism. And I want to give you a heads up. Next week, we're going to do just that. Next week, we're going to give you the opportunity to be baptized, to mark this pivot point for the rest of your lives. I've got a lot of great moments in my life. I've been married. I remember that day like yesterday. I've had three kids. RCC, I mean, just a lot of great things have happened in my life. But I want to be honest with you, the best thing that ever happened to me is when I gave my life to Jesus Christ and got baptized. Because that decision set up all the other decisions. That was the best day of my life. And you can have that day too. You've seen others to get baptized today. You can join them. People are already signing up for every single one of our services next week. If you can't be here on Sunday, we're going to have one on Thursday night. People are signing up for that one as well. Go to riverchristian.church slash baptism. You can QR code what's on the screen right now. And if you've never been baptized as a believer in Jesus, this is your next step. And if you have questions, I want to encourage you to come because we're going to answer me those questions. But I want to invite you to define and declare your belief and repentance in Jesus by being baptized. And can we just give God the praise of what he's going to do next week? Go ahead and just praise him because it's going to be amazing. I just want you to know there's not a single person gathered here today or watching online that doesn't have a sin in their life that they need to pivot from. If you're new here, let me go ahead and give you full disclosure because we know we got some new people in the room. When you're at this church called RCC, I just want you to know something real quick. You're surrounded by people like us and you're in bad company. I really mean that. Because we're just a colossal collection of moral goof-ups and that's why we're here. There are people here who've done some serious sinning this past week that we've lost some battles with. We've lost some battles with pride and with greed and with profanity and with alcoholism, pornography and insensitivity and lying and stealing and with our own sexuality. And I just want you to know you're sitting in bad company. And if that's okay with you, you're welcome here. But I want you to know this next one because this is just as important. We want you to know this church is committed to turning from our sins, exposing them before a loving and a holy God. We're not going to deny our sins. We're not going to make excuses for them. We're committed to asking God for the forgiveness of our sins. But listen, we're committed to pivoting from our sins. We really are. We're committed to pivoting from our sins through God's power, heading in a new direction. And if you want that for your life, you're in the right place. So what are you going to do today? What are you going to do with this? Will you stand with me? Are you content on having a relationship with God that's just cordial, just distant? Are you really serious about doing some really hard work, some doing some business and having God transform you? I just want to give you a moment. So bow your head right now. If you close your eyes and bow your head. I just want to give you some moments between you and God. Let me ask you this question. Has the Holy Spirit convicted you about something today? A sin that you may be flirting with, giving into? Isn't it time to confess it? Then ask Jesus to help you pivot from, to be transformed away from that sin? By the way, that's God's specialty. Like, that's what He does. He wants to lead you out of darkness into his light. So go ahead and talk to God and ask Him to help you.
God, I'm grateful for your amazing grace. I thank you for how you're moving through this series. God, we just begin by confessing that we're sinners. We don't want to deceive ourselves. We bring our brokenness to you. It's hurt you. It's hurt others. It's hurt ourselves. And we know it caused Jesus to have to go on the cross. And we thank you that we confess our sins, Lord, you're faithful to us, and you forgive us, you cleanse us of all wickedness, and God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, transform us. Help us to pivot from a life of sin, to walk in a new direction, just like our, my brother Josh did, each day, and do it arm in arm with one another, to encourage and affirm one another. Father, we thank you that we're in this together. That thank you for setting us free and helping us walk in a new direction. All because, because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name and everyone said, amen. If there's any way to be a blessing to you, our prayer team is up here. They love to pray about whatever it is. When you get that prayer card, you can bring it up here. Maybe you want to pray for somebody else. Maybe you have a joy you want to share. Maybe today you want to give your life to Jesus or pray by yourself up here on the stairs. Whatever it is, we're here for you. And let's just worship together as we talk about running to the loving arms of God. Can we give our loving God praise? He is faithful. He is just. Why don't you come to him right now as we worship him together.
Hey, well, we pray today has been a blessing for you. As you make your way out, don't forget, we are starting today our merch sale, and we have just amazing RCC hats, clothes, and shirts, all kinds of stuff. Let's put RCC out in our community and just tell of the great things that God is doing here. Also, the Thanksgiving uh, giving baskets, Megan Mills, they have a table out there. If you have yet to do so, go and pick up a card so we can make sure that we're bringing stuff to provide for our community and just be the love of Christ to each other, okay? Hey, we love you. Be blessed, and we will see you next week.